in introducing you or introducing Eddie Lyons to you. I know that for most of you he doesn't need any introduction, uh, but in case he does, this is Eddie Lyons. Uh, he's uh, one of the most experienced members of our club and uh, he's going to uh, give us the lecture whose title is uh, uh, Luna Terra Cognita, The Rise and Decline of Apollo's False Paradigm. So without further ado, I hand you over to Eddie. Thanks, uh, thank you for that, Peter. Okay, so the moon, um, as Pat was just mentioning, it's a very familiar sight in the sky. And it's been leave the lights. No, leave the lights. Yeah. And it's been an object of cultural interest uh, for millennia and an object of uh, scientific study ever since Galileo first turned his telescope on it in the uh, early 1600s. Uh, we've uh, produced many maps of the near side of it over the centuries, first by visual telescopic observation, later by photography, and uh, much more recently, of course, from orbiting spacecraft, which, has, which have extended our, um, the coverage to the entire globe, including the, the far side. And we've given names to its features. So we've made it quite familiar to ourselves. And yet, at the same time, it has always been very mysterious, um, very unknown. So its origin and its history were unknown to us uh, because we had, of course, no physical presence there. We had no bits of the moon that we could put our hands on and uh, analyze in detail. Now, in 1961, President John F. Kennedy gave NASA what was perhaps its defining uh, mission. And NASA responded with one of our greatest um, scientific and engineering undertakings, the Apollo program. Now, 12 astronauts landed on the moon between 1969 and 1972. But Apollo wasn't just a technical and a scientific proje uh, project. It was part of the Cold War, the geostrategic contest being waged against the Soviet Union by projecting soft power influence globally alongside the use of hard military power in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Now, the Soviets responded with their own very highly secret uh, program to land cosmonauts on the moon, but their effort failed catastrophically because of internal conflicts of interest and also a comparative lack of funding. But they did succeed with three much smaller uh, robotic sample return missions between 1969 and 1976. Now this talk isn't really, isn't just about the Apollo program or its Soviet effort. It's really about the, uh, the science, or at least part of the science, to which they both contributed because they provided an opportunity for research, not only into the, uh, the origin and evolution of the moon, but also um, the place of our own planet within the wider uh, context of the solar system. Now, Apollo brought back 382 kilograms of rocks and other samples uh, from the moon, and the Soviet missions brought back another 321 grams. Now, the success of Apollo meant that we finally had bits of the moon that we could study in our laboratories. And uh, they have been an analysed many times over the past five decades. Now, analysis of their mineralogical composition uh, vastly improved our geological understanding of the moon. And radiometric dating of some of the rocks um, also allowed us to um, assign dates to some of the features on the moon. Now these dates then established a chronology for the, um, the very early history of the moon and by extension of the inner parts of the solar system. 
And the chronology that was established was then used to create um, a long-lasting paradigm which was effectively part of the legacy for the efforts of the Apollo astronauts and the many, many thousands of support staff who had made their missions possible. <coughs> but before I go into more detail about that, uh, I'm going to step back a few centuries because scientific thinking about how the solar system uh, came into being originated, of course, with the Copernican Revolution in the 16th century. Now, this overturned an existing paradigm uh, by removing the Earth from being considered as the centre of everything and replacing it with the Sun. And that, of course, was another false paradigm that had to be uh, overcome at a later time. Now, the earliest hypothesis for the formation of the solar system was proposed by René Descartes in the early 17th century. And now, over the following three centuries, many other hypotheses uh, were put forward, such as the theory of planetary evolution by Emanuel Swedenborg in 1734, or the nebular hypothesis by Kant in, in 1755, which was then uh, modified and improved by Laplace in 1796. Or specific to the moon, there was George Darwin's uh, fission hypothesis, where he um, believed that the moon separated from a very rapidly spinning proto-Earth. Now, other ideas, of course, were advanced um, over the centuries, but by the 1960s, no <coughs> hypothesis for either the formation of the solar system or for the origin of the moon presented a complete and cohesive explanation. Now, also by the 1960s, the science of geology had advanced greatly since its origins in the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, studies of landforms and rock strata made it clear that Earth is far older than uh, some orthodoxies had believed. Billions of years, rather than the few thousand uh, calculated by Archbishop James Osher in the 17th century, or the uh, less than 10,000 years still insisted upon by modern-day creationists. Now, radiometric dating allows us to determine the age of rocks. Um, it's based on measuring the relative proportions of various elements or their isotopes that uh, result from uh, radioactive decay. So it acts like a clock to measure very long periods of time. Now, a broad geological history of Earth um, was formed, including absolute ages for many individual strata within this basic framework. And now, by extension, if Earth formed billions of years ago, then so too must the other planets and minor bodies of the solar system. Now, we were able to place the... Um, the formation of such bodies at between 4.5 and 4.6 billion years ago by using radiometric dating on meteorites and then, um, and then comparing the mineralogy of those meteorites with spectroscopic measurements um, of asteroids. But the absence of an atmosphere and uh, running water on the surface of the moon means that many familiar geological processes simply are not applicable to understanding its alien environment. Uh, so sedimentary rocks like limestone or sandstone just do not exist there. And uh, plate tectonics are also absent. Um, and that just happens to be a theory that came into favour in the 1960s to explain Earth's uh, continental drift. But the basic geological principle of superposition of stratigraphy, that uh, younger strata form on top of older strata, does apply to the Moon. Now, to the naked eye, the Moon presents a series of lighter and darker areas. Now, er um, early telescopic observations, such as those by Galileo, showed that the darker areas, the maria, are generally um, flat, while the lighter areas are mountainous uplands. But the dominant features are craters. 
Now, the Uplands are very densely cratered, while the Maria have comparatively fewer and smaller craters. Uh, the craters measure anywhere from hundreds of kilometres across down to and below the resolving limit of uh, telescopes here on Earth. Now, using the, princ the principle of superposition of stratigraphy, it is possible to determine relative ages of these major features, whether they are older or younger, but not give them absolute ages. Now, a second technique uh, to determine relative age is to count um, crater densities. So older surfaces like the, the uplands have many craters of a, a given size, while the maria have far fewer similarly sized craters. And in the highlands, it's also possible to determine a sequence um, of cratering or a relative sequence of cratering because younger craters such as this one are superimposed on older craters which in turn are superimposed on even older craters again. Now well into the 20th century um, many lunar, uh, lunar researchers believed that the lunar craters were of um, volcanic origin. And this reflected humanity's familiarity with uh, volcanic craters here on Earth, dating all the way back at least as far as classical antiquity. But it didn't really account for the vast difference in size between the Moon's craters and Earth's much smaller volcanoes. Uh, but there was a, uh, an alternative hypothesis. In 1665, Robert Hooke speculated that the Moon's craters uh, were formed by impact. But he soon dismissed the idea because at that time space was believed uh, to be empty. It wasn't until the discovery of asteroids from 1801 onwards, such as the four shown here on this mid-19th century map of the solar system, plus the recognition of the cosmic origin of meteorites, that the impact hypothesis was revived in the 1820s principally by Franz uh, von Grutheisen. But most lunar researchers continued to regard the uh, lunar craters as being of volcanic origin. But the impact hypothesis um, did gain a few adherents. Oh, in 1892, the American geologist Grove Gilbert presented a paper in which he um, advocated for the uh, impact hypothesis. And from his own telescopic observations, he also recognised uh, features extending in a radial pattern away from Mare Imbrium. And he called these features sculpture. Now, do keep this in mind because we will return to it in about a century. In 1908, the event at, at Tunguska in Siberia was humanity's first recorded historic experience of a cosmic impact, making it clear that Earth is not immune from such events. And soon after this, one of the first uh, features, the first craters on Earth to be accepted as an impact crater, um, it was already known as Coon Butte in Arizona. Now, it's better known today, of course, as the Barringer Meteorite Crater, or more simply as Meteor Crater. Several papers in the early 20th century, such as this one by uh, the geologists John Boone and Claude Albritton in, in 1936, um, described its formation by meteoritic impact, along with several other craters uh, around the world. And in 1946, another two geologists, uh, Robert Dietz and Reginald Daly, each made the case for the uh, impact origin of lunar craters. And Reginald Daly also presented his own hypothesis for the origin of the moon. So it's notable that since the 19th century, um, American geologists in particular were interested um, in studying the moon as a comparison by which to understand the Earth better. They recognise that lunar craters are formed uh, by impact, 
and um, the same must apply to at least some craters here on Earth. But in 1949, it was an astronomer, um, Ra uh, Ralph Baldwin, who published a seminal study of lunar craters, comparing them with uh, bomb craters from the two world wars. Now, with his own wartime experience in developing um, fuses and testing explosives, he concluded that lunar craters are formed by an explosive action from meteoritic impact. Now, Baldwin wasn't the first to reach this uh, conclusion, um, but, he, but, his conclu but he was the first for where it uh, was um, generally accepted by other researchers. Uh, many earlier researchers had failed to recognise the conversion of kinetic energy in a hypervelocity impact into a very powerful shock-driven um, explosion. Now, the renowned geologist Eugene Shoemaker took such studies further in the late 1950s by showing similarities between the Barringer meteorite crater and craters formed by nuclear explosions at the Nevada test site. And by 1970, the Canadian astronomer Carlisle Beals and uh, German geologist uh, Wolf von Engelhardt had identified over 50 probable impact craters here on Earth. They used radiometric dating on these craters, and this provided an estimate uh, for the frequency of such impacts within recent uh, geological times. Now, returning to the moon, uh, William Hartman studied the density of lunar cratering, uh, and he estimated that the basalt plains um, that form the Maria are about 3.6 billion years old on average. Now, that's an astonishingly accurate uh, estimate, as it turns out. Now, this implied that these huge basins, this, so this is Mare Imbrium, and there's a huge basin, an impact basin, that contains this Mare. So it implied that these basins must have been uh, formed at an even earlier time, and of course by impact. And then by comparing the sparse cratering on the Maria with the dense cratering in the highlands, um, Hartman concluded that the rate of impact in the very early history of the moon must have been at least 160 times the impact rate that we see today. Now, he published his uh, results in 1966 as evidence that what was called an early intense bombardment had occurred in the first few hundred million years after the moon formed. And that was followed by an exponential decline to the very low impact rate that we see today. Now, the, uh, the physical chemist, uh, Harold Urey, who was... Uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in 1934 for his discovery of deuterium. He was also interested in uh, planetary studies. Now, because the lunar surface does not have erosion processes like the Earth does, um, Yuri was convinced that the moon's original crust must remain intact and that it would hold a vast reservoir of uh, primordial material dating all the way back to the origin of the solar system. Now, Yuri became an advisor to NASA in the early stages of the Apollo program. And um, he was reputed to have said, in a paraphrased form, uh, give me one rock from the moon and I can give you the history of the solar system. Very confident. Now, his belief, which was shared uh, by others, um, set an expectation for the results that would come from the analysis of samples that would be returned from the moon. Now, he and others believed that the moon's original crust would exist or would, would, um, was still in existence in the highlands. But this was contradicted by, um, by cratering studies. Ralph Baldwin concluded in 1969 that the lunar highlands are so densely cratered 
that they must have reached saturation level uh, very early on, uh, whereby earlier impact craters are obliterated by later impacts. Now, impact saturation also implies that the original surface of uh, the moon's crust has been obliterated through, um, through the energy release, the shock propagation, and the melting uh, that results from cosmic impact. And indeed, even as early as 1949, uh, the geologist Robert Dietz had reached a similar conclusion on much less evidence. But these findings apparently did not make their way into NASA's planning for Apollo. So, by the time uh, the Apollo missions began to fly, the impact nature of the lunar surface was well established, but not all of its implications were taken into account. Now, American geologists were world leaders, so NASA very quickly formed a team to train the Apollo astronauts to collect, uh, lunar, um, to collect lunar samples. The first astronauts were not scientists or geologists. They were military test pilots whose uh, primary function was to fly the spacecraft from the Earth to the Moon and back again. So they required training in the geological fieldwork that they were going to conduct on the lunar surface. Now, only later did NASA select a group of scientist astronauts, including one geologist, uh, Harrison Schmidt, who became the only one from that group to make it to the lunar surface. The first two Apollo landings um, returned only very limited samples. Their primary goal was to prove the engineering and technical aspects of landing on and returning from the moon. But once their samples were, um, were secured in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory in Houston, they underwent preliminary compositional, and radiometric, uh, compositional, ana compositional analysis and radiometric dating. And the results helped to finalize the geological strategy for the five remaining Apollo missions. Now, of course, only four of those missions landed on the moon because Apollo 13 failed. So the last four Apollo landings um, were completed by 1972. And during Apollo 15, uh, David Scott and James Irwin collected one rock made of anorthosite, which the original lunar crust was expected to be made of. So they thought that it was from the lunar crust and that it had been ejected onto the surface uh, by an impact. Now once... Um, once they were back in flight on the way back to Earth, they held a, a press conference and a journalist asked them a question about this rock, referring to it as the Genesis Rock. And that's a moniker that has st uh, stuck with it ever since. And perhaps that question reflects the, uh, the prior expectations of Harold Urey and others. But contrary to those expectations, um, radiometric dating of Apollo rocks showed very few dates prior to about four billion years ago. The so-called Genesis rock did not live up to its name. Um, it's about 4.1 billion years old, rather than the anticipated 4.5 to 4.6 billion years, like the meteorites. So these findings were puzzling, to say the least. Now, if we look at some of the dates provided by the Apollo missions, especially these ones in yellow, so we see that the Apollo 14 and 15 samples provided dates of about 3.85 to 3.86 billion years that were um, linked to the Imbrium Basin impact. A sample from Apollo 16 provided a date of about 3.92 billion years that was assigned rather tentatively to the Nectaris Basin impact. And another date of about 3.76 billion years was also tentatively assigned to the Orientale Basin impact. And Apollo 17 provided a date of 3.86 to 3.87 billion years that was, in all honesty, very tenuously assigned to the Serenitatis Basin impact. 
Now, because of their stratigraphic relationships, these impacts in particular are very important if we want to understand the earliest geological history of the Moon. But note that all of these dates are rather close to one another and they even overlap to a certain extent. Now at about this time in the 1960s and 1970s, the theory of planetary formation by accretion uh, came into favour. Now it is still um, our best theory of planetary formation and it's supported by lots of evidence including very recent observations of protoplanetary disks in orbit around other stars. Now, the concept of an early intense bombardment, as outlined by uh, William Hartman in 1966, is consistent with uh, this theory. So once a planet forms, it, its surface continues to be bombarded by smaller bodies as it gravitationally clears its orbit around the Sun. The rate of bombardment declines exponentially in the first few hundred million years after the formation of the, um, of the planet. And it then declines more gradually over the following billions of years until we reach the very low rate of impact that we see today. But we have a lack of dates from Apollo from these very early times. Uh, and in particular a concentration of dates at about 3.9 billion years. Now, several papers on the radiometric dating of Apollo samples published between 1973 and 1975 um, proposed a modification to the exponential decline in cratering rates. One team called this a terminal cataclysm or terminal lunar cataclysm, and another team in 1975 brought in the term late heavy bombardment. Now even though this is very early in, uh, in geological history from our perspective, it's actually very late in the context of uh, planetary formation. Now the research teams argued that as many as six large impact basins were formed during a comparatively short period of about 100 to 200 million years, about 3.9 billion years ago. And those, um, those would include the Serenitatis, Nectaris, Imbrium and Orientale basins. Now such large impacts would have the effect of resetting the radiometric clocks of lunar rocks through uh, shock and melting. And this terminal cataclysm, or late heavy bombardment, became the dominant paradigm in the 1970s and 1980s by which to understand the earliest geological history um, of the Moon, the first 700 million years or so after the Moon formed, and by extension of the Earth and the inner solar system. And by 1990, the late heavy bombardment seemed to be confirmed by a new study of melt rocks from the, uh, the Apollo samples. These again showed a lack of early dates, uh, which Graham Ryder interpreted to show a very low impact rate prior to 4 billion years ago, and then a very uh, great increase in major impact about 3.9 billion years ago. Now, in hindsight, Ryder does seem to have violated the maxim that absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. Uh, there's the obvious disjuncture of um, how to explain crater saturation in the highlands if there was so little uh, cratering or so few impacts prior to four billion years ago. And he also seems to have ignored the fact that the late heavy bombardment really only takes into consideration the formation of about four to six of the very large impact basins. There are in fact around 45 such features known on the Moon. So when could these have formed if there were so few, few impacts before four billion years ago? <coughs> Now, two years later, uh, Ross Taylor listed arguments both for and against the late heavy bombardment. 
yet he concluded that the term late heavy bombardment is now too thoroughly entrenched in the lunar literature to be changed. Now, this is not a good scientific argument, but it does perhaps reflect the wider sentiment of the times. There were uh, other researchers who, whose findings appeared to show a much longer-lived period of impact, but they, they too referred to this as a late heavy bombardment, so they effectively were changing the meaning of the term, and they were also reflecting the sentiment that had been expressed by Ross Taylor. So the term, late heavy bombardment, if not the original meaning, was, uh, was well entrenched. Now you can find uh, the late heavy bombardment mentioned in textbooks and in popular books on astronomy and in television documentaries and YouTube videos and of course also on uh, Wikipedia although this is actually quite a good summary. Yet from the outset there were alternative views from uh, researchers who did not accept that uh, the, interpretation, <coughs> the interpretation of um, the lack of early dates from Apollo samples must imply a late um, or a terminal cataclysm or a late heavy bombardment. Now Apollo did recover a few rocks made of an orthocyte which the original lunar crust was expected to be made of but they were not at the anticipated age of 4.5 to 4.6 billion years. This is consistent with Ralph Baldwin's 1969 paper that the original lunar surface was saturated by impact cratering. A major implication of impact cratering is that the rate at which new rock forms through, um, from impact melt is exceeded by its destruction by later impacts. So the radiometric signature of such rocks simply do not survive into later times. And it's not until the impact rate falls below a certain level, which appears to have happened about 4 billion years ago, that such radiometric signatures then can survive uh, later impacts into more recent times. Now, the rate of impact before 4 billion years simply cannot be determined, except that it was very high, because it's hidden behind um, an impenetrable barrier formed by impact saturation. And William Hartman used the term stonewall effect uh, to refer to this. And that was a not-so-subtle reference to political events that were then dominating um, American interests. So the lack of early dates is actually a feature of an early intense bombardment. A late heavy bombardment simply is not required as an explanation. So what do the data that were interpreted as a late heavy bombardment actually show? Um, do they really date three or four of the truly enormous um, basin forming impacts? Um, as, the, as the 1970s research teams thought. This geological map of the moon was published by the United States Geological Survey in 1971, and it's based on telescopic observations and spacecraft data from the 1960s. Now, these are the locations of the Apollo landings, and for the sake of completeness, I've included the three Soviet sample return missions, and the much more recent uh, Chinese one. Now, once Apollo's 11, over here, and 12, had proved the engineering requirements, uh, the later Apollos were targeted to answer questions of particular interest. So Apollo 14 was to investigate ejecta from the Imbrium Basin Impact Apollo 15 was to investigate the base of Montes Apenninus, which form the edge of the Imbrium Basin. Apollo 16 was to investigate um, a, a location in the highlands to search for remnants of the lunar crust 
and also um, evidence of recent volcanism, and also potentially to um, investigate ejecta from the nearby Nectaris Basin impact. And Apollo 17 was to sample the Serenitatis Basin impact. In 1998, Larry Haskin and his team published a geochemical study that showed ejecta from the Imbrium Basin impact is spread so far and wide that it potentially dominates locations even as distant as the sites of Apollos, uh, Apollos 16 and 17. So the samples that supposedly dated the Serenitatis and Nectaris basin impacts now seem to be from the, uh, the Imbrium impact. Now one objective of Apollo was to sample locations separated far enough from one another that they could characterise the geology of those locations. Ironically, it appears that wherever Apollo landed, Imbrium impact ejecta was present on the surface. Um, such was the enormous scale of that particular impact. Ironically, the only exceptions were Apollos 11 and 12, where the Imbrium impact ejecta is buried under later Mare basalts. So one of the foundations of the late heavy bombardment is actually negated by this study. And this is entirely in line with a paper that had been published in 1974 by Ralph Baldwin. There, um, and in that paper he stated there was no major series of events which produced the terminal lunar cataclysm approximately 3.95 billion years ago. The magnitude and timing of the Imbrium collision was the single overwhelming event of that time. And that should not come really as a surprise. If we go back a century to uh, G.K. Gilbert's paper, if we invert his sketch of the moon because North is at the bottom here to match a telescopic uh, image. And we then overlay that sketch onto the geological map of the moon. We find that Gilbert's Imbrium sculpture extends to and beyond the locations of Apollos 16 and 17. Now the gaps in the coverage are where the ejecta is buried under later Mare basalt. Now, the difference in the outline of the moon can be accounted for if um, Gilbert's observations were performed when uh, lunar liberation brought um, Imbrium into a more favourable viewing position. Now, we could argue that Gilbert's paper was far ahead of its time, but in truth, it was entirely a product of its time. It was just a product of a very skilled observer. The paper published by Baldwin in 1974 was effectively ignored. And 24 years later, the paper by Haskin and his team received very little attention. So the late heavy bombardment paradigm uh, continued. Now we can ask uh, why the late heavy bombardment has lasted for so long in the face of increasing contradictory evidence. And indeed, why did it become so strongly entrenched uh, in the first place? Why did it override earlier research, such as Ralph Baldwin's 1969 paper, that proved to be correct even before Apollo's first landing? Now, undoubtedly, it was based on one of the things that I said at the very beginning of this talk. We finally had a presence, albeit temporary, um, on the moon. We had in our possession uh, bits of the moon that we could study and analyse in detail in our laboratories. We could determine the ground truth, as it were, of those locations on the moon that we had visited. So it's understandable and perhaps not unreasonable that the evidence from actual lunar rocks should take precedence, should be regarded as more important as more legitimate than earlier contrary interpretations, especially those based on telescopic observations from the 
remote location of Earth. Now, in hindsight, we can recognize that many of those earlier observers had achieved a really good understanding of the lunar environment. Their interpretations derived from uh, studying craters, from crater densities and impact saturation in particular, proved to be entirely prescient. And yet, at the time, the, the wider planetary science community preferred the interpretations based on the radiometric dating of actual lunar rocks, and understandably so. Now, in the early 2000s, the late heavy bombardment still had plenty of life in it. It wasn't until a pair of planetary science conferences in 2015 that it was so seriously undermined by contradictory evidence that it was finally considered to no longer be tenable. But even though it is now largely um, discredited for most uh, planetary scientists, the late heavy bombardment continues to exert an influence uh, in other disciplines. So it's still used as a constraint on uh, origin of life theories or on models <coughs> of Earth's early geological or climatological development. And it still appears in textbooks and, of course, in popular books and popular articles on, on astronomy. So it could take many, many more years before its influence finally diminishes in those areas. Now, in the 1990s, lunar exploration uh, picked up once again. Orbiting spacecraft from the United States, Japan, Europe, China, India and Korea have mapped its surface in greater detail than ever before. And there has also been a resumption in robotic landings, uh, three from China and one from India. And of course, just in the last couple of months, um, there have been two partially successful landings, one from Japan in January and just last month, uh, a commercially operated spacecraft from the United States. Now, both of those spacecraft did touch down on the moon intact, but both of them fell over, completely compromising their missions. <clears throat> now, the most impressive of the landings um, has to be China's Chang'e 4 mission, which performed the first ever landing on the far side of the moon. And we have also had the first samples returned from the moon since 1976. China's Chang'e 5 mission in 2020 brought back 1.7 kilograms of samples from northern Oceanus Procellarum. And they provided a preliminary age of 1.96 billion years for the mare basalts in that area. And that's far younger than any of the basalt samples brought back by Apollo missions. Now, in the coming years, there are many more missions planned to the moon, including China's Chang'e 6, which will attempt the first sample return from the far side of the moon in the next few months. Now, this is a particularly exciting prospect because, if successful, it might date the creation of the enormous South Pole Aitken Basin which is one of the largest and earliest impact basins in the entire solar system. And India and Japan are also uh, planning a combined sample return mission before 2030 to the uh, South Polar region. And of course, there's a new generation of missions to finally return people to the moon for the first time since 1972. The, uh, the Artemis program, which is uh, the, the NASA-led uh, international program, plans to land its first crew on the moon in 2026, or more likely in 2027, uh, following delays caused by problems in funding, thanks to the US Congress, and in developing hardware, such as the spacesuits. China has also announced plans to land uh, its first crew on the moon by 2030. And even India has a very ambitious uh, aim to land its first crew on the moon by 2040, 
which is quite something given that they haven't yet launched their first crew into Earth orbit, something they're planning to do next year. So in the next decade and a half, we should have many, uh, much more exploration of the lunar surface, especially in the South Polar region. And we should have many more samples uh, brought back to Earth for analysis. Now, one of the eventual outcomes of all of this attention being paid to the moon is the idea to establish a lunar economy, opening up our nearest neighbour to uh, commercial exploitation. An essential element of such an initiative will be to improve the geological understanding of the moon. Now, this will be just as imperative as it is here on Earth, where resource extraction and exploitation first requires a detailed geological context. Now, how much of the new lunar geological data will remain open access for scientific analysis and how much of it might end up being retained as um, privately held, commercially sensitive property would have to be seen in the coming decades. But whatever the outcome, we will get a much improved understanding of the moon's formation and geological history. Now, to conclude, um, in this talk I've been concentrating on the radiometric dating of Apollo samples and the interpretation derived from that, but not on the compositional analysis. Now, Apollo's geological samples vastly improved our understanding of the geological stratigraphy of the moon. And that's summarised in this global map prepared by the United States Geological Survey in 2020, which of course includes data from a lot of more recent missions as well. Nevertheless, it is poignant to, to sort of ponder that as the few remaining Apollo astronauts approach the, end, uh, the ends of their lives, part of the legacy that they worked so hard to establish has been overturned. Now, it will be replaced by an improved understanding, not only based on new evidence and samples, but also on new analysis or renewed analysis of the samples that they brought back from the moon half a century ago. Now, Apollo barely scratched the surface of the moon. Um, if it marked the beginning of lunar geology, we are perhaps only now reaching the end of that beginning. The next chapter in the geological exploration of the moon is opening. Now, just as the geological understanding of the Earth is by no means complete after three centuries of increasingly intensive exploration and exploitation, the geology of the moon should reveal new information uh, for decades and perhaps even centuries to come. Now this will include uh, a much better understanding of the early history of the moon, the, the dates and sequence of formation of the major impact basins from that time. That will be a true legacy for these pioneering astronauts and a fitting replacement for Apollo's false paradigm. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie. I, uh, I always thought this, I mean, I've read about this great heavy bombardment, and I presume it was a thing. Now it turns out it may not be a thing at all. Um, <laughs> I've got a couple of questions, but um, I've been criticised for asking them first, so who wants to ask a question before me? One of the theories that I remember was that the, the tail led the formation of the moon. Oh, yeah. Is that, I mean, is there such any evidence from that, or is it um, is that still running? Um, well, that's the, um, the giant impact theory. Uh, well, that, that, that would be very early in the planetary formation process. So, um, arguably that would have been 
around 4.5 to 4.6 billion years ago, right at the very, well, the, the planetary formation process would take millions of years. Um, so that's a very short period of time in comparison to the billions of years that we tend to talk about in this context. So the Thea collision uh, would have been, as it's argued, a Mars-sized protoplanet colliding with a proto-Earth. So that would have been probably about 4.6 billion years ago. Um, there's, and then the moon would have formed from the remnants of that collision in orbit around the Earth. Now, there are, there's plenty of evidence, as far as I'm aware, um, in favour of it by, the, by looking at the constituents of, or the sort of chemical constituents of both the moon and the Earth. There's enough similarities between them to argue either that the moon and the Earth formed at the same distance from the, uh, from the sun, or that Thea would have formed at a similar distance from the sun as the Earth, and therefore would have had a, a relatively similar chemical composition, because it would have formed from the same part of the, the gas and dust cloud that, surrounds the, that surrounded the sun. Um, we, wouldn't, we would not see evidence for it either on the surface of the Earth or on the surface of the Moon because any evidence for it would have been, on the Moon it would have been obliterated by the early intense bombardment that continued for hundreds of millions of years. On the Earth it simply wouldn't be um, possible to see because of plate tectonics completely recycling the surface of the Earth over billions of years. But certainly it's the most favoured theory at the moment for how the moon formed because it does, um, it does answer a lot of questions about things like the um, angular momentum that exists within the Earth-Moon system, the tilt of the moon's orbit relative to the Earth's orbit, uh, and the tilt of the Earth relative to its orbit, so the axial tilt of the Earth, and arguably the axial tilt of the Moon as well. Although the axial tilt of the Moon could have been changed by some of these truly enormous basin-forming impacts over the, over the subsequent hundreds of millions of years. I'm not sure if that answers your question. As far as I'm aware, it's still the, the one theory that does answer most questions about how the, how, how the moon formed and why the Earth-Moon system has the characteristics that it does today. So since the start of detailed observations of the moon, I know that in geological terms that's a very short period. Yeah. Have we actually, or has anybody actually observed a single, uh, the formation of a single crater on the moon? Nothing large, but there, um, there are campaigns of almost continuous observation of the moon to detect uh, impacts by meteors. Not necessarily meteorites, but the small meteors that we would sort of see through our atmosphere on a frequent basis. So impacts like that have been recorded fairly frequently in the last 20 years or so. Nothing that forms a significantly large crater, but, um, but certainly, yeah, Im impacts do happen quite frequently, but they tend to be very small. Um, it's highly unlikely during sort of the entire, well, I was going to say it's highly unlikely during the entire existence of humans, but that's not quite true. There's, there's a couple of craters that were investigated by the Apollo astronauts that formed within the past couple of million years. So that is within the lifetime of the human species. But they're quite small. They're only about a kilometre across. Um, I don't think there's anything larger than that that's been dated as having formed during the entire existence of humanity. So less than, less than about six million years old. Uh, if you're talking about craters that are 10, 20, 100 kilometers um, across, most of them would be tens or hundreds of millions of years old. Uh, like the, the crater Tycho, 
in the southern highlands is about 100 million years old, and that's about 80 kilometers across. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, what's your opinion on the United States' motor for going back to the moon, given the fact that they stopped in 1972, and then it's just almost 60 years late, and then don't get me wrong, I'm delighted they're going back, mm -hmm. I'm just not sure what the motive is. Exploration. Yeah. You know, but you see, I know <laughs> if we lived in the world where that was the only reason, but yeah. there's always a cynical reason. Like, well, the cynical reason is commercial exploitation. Yeah. But that's not what NASA would be doing. Yeah. Because NASA doesn't do commercial operations. Um, what, what NASA is enabling, just like it did with the International Space Station, instead of building and owning rockets and spacecraft, a business that it got out of when it retired the space shuttle. <laughs> NASA instead came up with the idea, prompted by many Congress people and senators, to instead uh, pay commercial companies to provide such services, which is why we have SpaceX launching astronauts to and from the International Space Station now. Um, NASA ha is pursuing a comparatively similar process with uh, the return to the moon. Now, it is developing its own rocket and spacecraft to take the astronauts from the surface of the Earth to, mo to lunar orbit. So that's the space launch system and the Orion spacecraft. And of course, it's doing the Orion spacecraft uh, in cooperation with the, United the European Space Agency. And that's why there will be European astronauts on these moon missions in the future. But in terms of getting from lunar orbit down onto the surface, they are looking for a commercial solution. So SpaceX is providing the spacecraft, the first spacecraft, that will take astronauts from lunar orbit down onto the surface and back again. There are other companies that are competing to do that as well. Um, I think Lockheed Martin is involved in one consortium to do that. Blue Origin. So Blue, Origin Blue Origin. Blue Origin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Blue Origin um, objected to SpaceX getting a sole contract from NASA, so they, um, so NASA had to reopen, not the competition because SpaceX still has the award it was given, but there's been an extension of the, or an expansion of the um, the award to include Blue Origin. Um, so I think beyond probably the second landing, SpaceX will do the first two landings. I think potentially Blue Origin might be in a position to have a spacecraft that would do the third landing, for example. But I think, um, but this, this, the other commercial aspect that NASA has been encouraging is instead of sending its own robotic spacecraft to land on the moon, it's giving contracts to companies to develop spacecraft to land on the moon, just like the, the Nova Sea lander last month, which included NASA uh, payloads, but also commercial payloads. And it wasn't launched or operated by NASA, it was launched by SpaceX, and then once it was in orbit, it was operated by the company, whose name escapes me, um, to, um, to navigate it from Earth orbit to lunar orbit and then land on the moon. But of course, it didn't quite succeed properly with its landing. But there's a lot more commercial missions like that um, in the pipeline over the coming few years where companies will be competing with each other to take not only NASA payloads, but payloads from other companies or universities or other researchers down onto the surface of the moon. And by doing that, while NASA isn't funding everything, because the companies have to provide a lot of funding for themselves, um, NASA is effectively providing seed money that can be used to develop these commercial capabilities. China would be the main competitor of the moon in the future, right? The main competitor? The China. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, China is doing a... Well, it's got a very active... Um, crewed space, pro space program. It's got its own permanently occupied space station in orbit. 
um, for the last few years. Um, and it's also developing heavy lift launchers that will be used for future moon missions. And it's quite openly stated its plans to land its own first crew on the moon in the South Polar region uh, by 2030. Maybe in 2030, but possibly maybe even a year or two before that. But yeah, if you want to regard it as competition, then yes. Um, the Americans certainly regard the Chinese as being competitors. The Europeans, I think, have a, a slightly alternative view. We view China as another potential partner rather than a competitor. Mm. Mm. Pat, is there, from a legal point of view, is there any possibility that a country can maintain to a part of the moon? Not according to the Outer Space Treaty. That does prohibit... Um, <coughs> That does prohibit signatories to the treaty from um, establishing uh, territorial claims on the moon. Um, now, I don't think the United States is a signatory to that treaty. Uh, the Senate never ratified it, but they do abide by it, um, as far as I'm aware. So they've certainly stated that they would never uh, lodge a territorial claim on the moon, but they do... They do argue that one of the threats from China is that that's exactly what China would do, even though China is a signatory to the Outer Space Treaty. And more recently, China, just in the last month, China has publicly stated that it does not have any territorial claims on the moon. Now, what territorial... No, the fact that territorial claims will not be made on the moon does not mean that resources from the moon cannot be owned. So the, so the land cannot be owned, but the resources that you extract from it can. And that is entirely within the legal framework of things like the Outer Space Treaty, or the Moon Treaty. I think there's a separate Moon Treaty as well. Thanks. Yeah. Now, we're kind of running out of time for questions now. So the question I mentioned to ask may not get asked. John. Yeah, this actually is. He's actually answered most of it. Uh, the question for the last couple was about treaty on, on, on the moon. But it obviously, he said that where it doesn't, uh, the, the treaty prevents the signatories from uh, making a claim to mm -hmm. the territory of the moon, but they could still explore the resources of the moon. Yes. And therefore, surely there's a need for a treaty to cover that sort of thing as well. Or, that, I think, is the argument that's going on, that there does need to be a treaty that will yeah. establish a legal framework for resource exploitation yeah. on the moon. Yeah. And then just one other question it was in regard to the bombardment of, uh, and of mm. the moon and uh, you know, the, the number of craters that are still visible there. And given the fact that you mentioned something about 50 craters were visible or have been found on the Earth. And that was back then. Yeah, but even, but, but there's still an awful lot more on the moon. Oh, yeah. Why is it they're, they're still visible and the ones on the Earth are the other? Well, the vast majority of craters on the Earth uh, have been destroyed through uh, plate tectonics. Um, on the Moon, there is a form of erosion. It's a very, very slow erosion process that's caused by this continuous bombardment by tiny meteoritic particles. Um, but it's a very slow process. Uh, to obliterate any of the large craters would take probably longer than the lifetime of the Moon the rate of erosion is so low. Yeah. So it's simply because there's either a lack of or a very low rate of erosion. Yeah. <coughs> Looks like my question will have to be deferred to tea time. In a few minutes, um, I, I, I have a few more um, uh, things to say to you, but in a few minutes I'll be closing the meeting, I'll be inviting you down here for tea, and then I, and anyone else who has a burning question in their heart can have a chat to Eddie and um, uh, ask our questions privately but for now it just remains for me to say Eddie thank you so much uh, I, uh, <laughs> I learned more about the moon and it's uh, the history of uh, theories about the moon that, uh, that I didn't know, I didn't know if uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, on behalf of the club, may I present you 
with this small gift and our thanks. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you.